Um, hello and welcome back and welcome to this second video in the loop analysis playlist uh, or this isn't really a playlist it's just kind of I guess a series. Um, so what I want to do in this video is I want to again kind of talk a little bit more about how operationally loop analysis is different from nodal analysis. So if you remember in nodal analysis so again starting with nodal analysis if you remember in nodal analysis, the big rule that we were talking about the whole time was Kirchhoff's current law, which we pretty much always talk about as just KCL. And what KCL said was that the sum of all the currents entering a node had to be zero. So if I took, if I looked at all of the currents that, and I imagine that all of the currents were flowing into a node, that and I summed all of those up that that would have to be equal to zero and if you remember in our nodal analysis playlist the way that we kind of thought about this was that any current what or if I summed up all of the current that went into any node in the circuit if I summed up all the current that went in it would have to equal all of the current the sum of all of the current that was flowing out of the node and there was a really easy way to think about this too imagine i've got a garden hose let me draw let me draw my garden hose green i think that all the garden hoses i've seen have been green so imagine i've got a, a green garden hose and then imagine that i put one of those y adapters on the end of the garden hose and I kind of extend it a little bit more extend it out there and extend it out over here and then let's say I put water into this side of the garden hose and let's say I put one gallon per second of I, I put one gallon per second of water into this end of the garden hose and let's say that, you know, the, the, you know, the Y coupling isn't exact and maybe these two hoses are different sizes. So I don't necessarily know what the flows out of this side of the hose are. But I do know one thing. Say I call this flow F1 and I call this flow F2. One thing I do know is that the sum of all of the currents out of this hose have got to equal whatever it is I'm putting into that nose so uh, into that into that hose or node so if I took these two currents F1 and F2 or those two flows F1 and F2 and I added them together F1 plus F2 that that would have to equal my input current that would have to equal one gallon per second so that was kind of the big picture uh, law that we used when we were doing nodal analysis. This was essentially what made nodal analysis possible. So now what we are going to be talking about, let me draw a line, kind of divide, divide ourselves up. What we are going to be talking about in loop analysis, loop analysis is Kirchhoff's voltage law. So just like we had Kirchhoff's current law, we are now going to have in loop analysis, we are going to have Kirchhoff's voltage law. And pretty much uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to write down, uh, I'm going to write down what Kirchhoff's voltage law is. And then we're going to talk about it some more. And we're also going to give kind of a real world example of how you can think about it. So what Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff's voltage law says is that the sum of all voltage differences around any closed loop in a circuit must be zero. So let me write that down. The sum of all voltage differences around any closed loop, any closed loop and we'll definitely see a bunch of examples of what we mean exactly by a closed loop in a circuit in a circuit must be zero so now uh let me just give you kind of an example of of what this is talking about and let's take a really simple circuit that we're just going to have four resistors arranged 
in kind of a uh, it arranged in kind of a square like this. And you might say like this is way too simple. I mean, there's clearly going to be zero current in here. There's not going to be anything uh, anything providing a voltage difference. And that's true, but we can still analyze it and this can still be pretty useful. Um, let's say, so we know from Ohm's law that if we had a current, say we've got a current that's flowing this way in our circuit. So uh, I guess we've got kind of a clockwise current flowing throughout our circuit. So if we have a current flowing this direction, we know that current across a resistance is always going to flow from a region of higher voltage to a region of lower voltage. So if we were measuring the voltage across this circuit and we wanted to relate it to this current, let's call this current, get the right color, let's call this current I1, I1. If we wanted to relate I1 to the voltage across that resistor, let's call this R1, we would know that we would have to say that the positive side of our voltage is here and the negative side of our voltage is here because the current is always going to flow from regions of higher voltage to regions of lower voltage. So let's call this V1. Then, you know, we're going to have the same exact thing across this resistance, right? We're going, the current's going to flow from the top to the bottom. So we're going to flow from uh, regions of higher voltage to regions of lower voltage and we'll call that difference V2. Same thing for this resistor. We're flowing from this direction to that direction, so that will be V3. And then same thing for this resistor over here. We're flowing from this direction to that direction, so we're going to call that V4. So now what KVL says is that if we sum up all of these voltage differences, if I took, get a new color, if I took V1 plus, oh, getting used to this new, sorry, getting used to this new pen tablet. If I took, come on, uh, no, that's not what I want. Um, sorry, sorry, having technical issues. Okay, so now if I took V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4. If I summed up all of those voltage differences around a closed loop in the circuit, right, and we see that this is a closed loop, it's a closed path, that that has got to sum to zero. And this is what we're going to be using pretty much the whole time we're doing a uh, loop analysis. Uh, so now let me kind of give you the same way we had the garden hose for KCL. Let me try to give you kind of a uh, another kind of real world example of this. So um, uh, if you've ever hiked up uh, mountains before, or gone on any type of hike where you're going up, uh, up, you know, different, uh, 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 I guess, going going through different kinds of elevation, going up in elevation and back down in elevation, you might know that as you get further away from sea level, so let's say that this down here is, you know, sea level, represented by blue as the ocean. As, as you climb further up from sea level, air pressure drops, right? Uh, air pressure goes, uh, goes down because there's less, uh, uh, there's less stuff on top of you that's being pulled down by gravity and there's, uh, uh, less air pressure. So now imagine you went on a hike up this mountain and you took kind of a windy path, you got to the top and then you kind of took a different path down and then you got back to your car right there and drove home. And imagine that you also took with you uh, a device that was measuring the barometric pressure. But pretty much what this device was telling you was just the difference between pressure from the last time you looked at it. So let's say you look at it at the bottom. You look at it and you say, okay, this is one bar, at, uh, one bar of uh, atmospheric pressure. So I believe that's uh, like 740 millimeters of mercury. So let's say we measure that at the bottom and then we start climbing up and we measure, let's say we measure 
right here. And we uh, see that we see that the measurement says that we have dropped by 15 millimeters of mercury. Then we measure it up here again and it says maybe we've dropped by another 20 millimeters of mercury. And then I start going down and I measure right here. Say uh, I've gone up by, um, I don't know, say I've gone up by 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, I measure right here and I've gone up by another 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, then I measure a bit more frequently, say I measure um, say I measure right here, I've gone up by five millimeters of mercury. I've measure again here, I've gone up by another five. And then I measure at the bottom, I've gone up by another five millimeters of mercury. So basically, what I should expect to see if I did this, if I went out on a hike and kind of measured those changes in barometric pressure while I was on the hike, if I just sum up all of these changes, I would expect that all of those differences would all sum to zero because I'm walking along a closed path, right? I'm going back to the same exact spot that I started from. I would expect to see the pressure change the whole time I'm on this hike but then when I get back, I would expect to see the pressure kind of return to the pressure on my device return to the normal state that I measured right when I started because I'm right at the same spot where I kind of started from. So KVL is kind of a similar concept, right? Because we're dealing with voltages in the circuit and voltage is basically electric pressure. It's a measurement of how badly uh, electrons want to move from uh, one area to the circuit to another, which is very similar to thinking about how badly do air particles want to move from one uh, region to to another. So uh, anyway, hopefully that uh, kind of helps. Hopefully that's not uh, needlessly over confusing you about this. But I did just kind of want to give you one similar real world example of of a KVL because I think KCL is very intuitive. It's very easy to get. Uh, KVL is a bit uh, less so, but it's still an equally very powerful law that's going to give us some very useful tools for analyzing circuits. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. And uh, in the next video, I'm basically going to continue through uh, more loop analysis uh, problems and explanations. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in a future video.